Good afternoon. How are you today? Before we get started in our program, we must remember those who are in the path of Hurricane Florence. It's such a massive storm. It's going to potentially wreak such havoc. Um, we continue to pray for everyone that is in that path and ask the Lord's protection as he wills it for each individual and their belongings. So the program today, we've got another um, bite of the apple. Can I say it that way? A <laughs> rare treat. John L. Moore is going to join us, to get, join us again. He came last week and today he's going to teach us. It's going to be great. As a fiction author, how do you create atmosphere and why do you need to write with authority? Well, John is going to tell us. He's not going to only answer these two questions, but he's going to show us how to do that in this teaching session. Hi, I'm Patricia Durgan, the Christian Message Coach, and this is Marketers on a Mission. We present marketing tutorials and interviews to help Christian writers and speakers take their message online. This is episode number 129, <clears throat> excuse me, how to create atmosphere and write with authority with distinguished writer John L. Moore. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, Patricia. So glad you're here today. Thank you for taking the time again. Two weeks in a row, baby. I'm still thinking about that bite of the apple. <laughs> I wondered what you might think of it. I didn't have that planned. <laughs> uh, jerky, maybe. Uh, you know, a little tough and raw and gritty. and But apple, you know, maybe. Yeah, of course, that's kind of how sin came about. Um, but... <laughs> But no, it's good to be here. Now, I want to say one thing, and, and I don't want this to sound patronizing, Patricia, but I, I wouldn't do this except for who you are. And I can tell who you are uh, by your countenance and by that quick laugh, because that's a rare gift. And you'll succeed in what you're doing because of that. Uh, I, I jokingly say that when you know when little boys are babies, they're circumcised, and little girls have their funny bone removed. Because right? uh, women with humor, you know, especially humor that men can relate to, you know, it can be pretty rare. There can be you know female to female humor, but you have that wonderful quick laugh, and that's so diffusing, and it colors the atmosphere. All right, see, so you are creating atmosphere by that quick laugh. And I'm a naturally serious person and have a lot of passion towards some very serious goals. And they're not necessarily as selfish as, as you know you might think. Um, I take certain things seriously. It doesn't mean I take me seriously. Mm -hmm. And but I need somebody like you just to go, <laughs> you know, and go, okay, take a breath. <laughs> All right. So Thank you very much. Thank you. No, it's very true. There's very uh, I have a we have a ranch woman friend who all the men love to be around just because of her sense of humor. All right, just that natural sense of humor. I have a barber in town where the men are lined up to have their hair cut and she's not humorous, but she makes men feel at ease. Mm -hmm. She just herself, she's natural. Mm -hmm. And um Oh, there was one other. Maybe it was you. But, <laughs> but there are those people that just have that capacity to, you know, be relaxed. And one of my desires here, well, I'll tell you who the other one is, L.B. Johnson. And I've never met her in person, corresponded with her some. Hopefully she's going to take this in at some point. One of my draws towards L.B. Was, at first was photography on her blog, and then it was, you know, her personality, and then I, I saw the writing, and she hasn't reached her potential. All right, L.B., you haven't arrived yet here. You got, <laughs> and she's so uh, good now. Oh, she's very good, uh, but she's got so much more potential. But the reason, one reason is men are comfortable with her voice. And what I'm hoping to address today is we have to come to some unity and quit balancing everything. And here's, my, here's what I'm wanting to say in that as I, as I talk about atmosphere and authority. Those two things come together. They're, what, they're very interlinked, and yet they can be separate. Too often, all of us, and, and I'll take men and women as an example, marriages as an example. If you're, uh, the male is over here saying, this is what, you know, what I believe, or this is the way I am. And the wife is saying, well, he's too extreme. 
I'm going to go over here, and this is what I believe, and this is why. Well, you're just trying to balance each other. No. And, you, and he says, well, okay, I'll move over here, and oh, I'll move over here. And you get further and further apart. Yes. And we're not called in uh, unity isn't balance. Unity is completion. It's coming together like this and filling the holes in the other person. All right, to become one body, to become one church, to become one uh, temple of living stones, each with our own individual, you know, brilliance. But in you know years of counseling that we've done, I've never gone wrong in telling married couples quit trying to balance each other. You're just going to go to extremes. Well, it's the same thing in our writing. I understand that there are women who need to write just for women because those women won't hear from somebody, you know, from a man, because of their background, you know, you know, whatever. We're all wounded, all right? First of all, every human is leaving a blood trail, all right? Now, we've got a choice in that. We can get out of that human blood because, especially if women, wolves follow blood trails. Yes. And if you want to walk in victimhood, you're going to attract wolves your entire life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right? Or we can make the choice to leave, to leave that residue of Christ behind us and leave a, a, the blood of Jesus behind us, mm -hmm. all right? And to move from the Adamic nature into the new nature in Christ and become a new man in Christ, all right? But in that process, as we go forward, my seriousness is a kingdom approach towards literature and uh, towards all things of the arts is I want to see the arts used to glorify God to bring in a great end time revival. Now, is that too lofty? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, can I be a small part of it? I don't know. But I know that since World War II, the church went into a bomb shelter mode. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, uh, everything about World War II, uh, our soldiers came home traumatized, and many of them adapted an attitude of, I don't want to go to church. I just want to go fishing or golfing. But I, I, want my, I want my children to be raised in the church. And they sent the woman and the kids went to church. And, the, yeah. you know, the dad went fishing. And the church got into a bomb shelter mentality. The world's about to end. Get in here. Hurry up. Get saved now because it's ending tomorrow. All right. And <clears throat> that went on for quite a while until the 60s exploded out the front door. And we lost a cultural revolution back then because the church was in their bomb shelter. Now, those of us that were in that cultural revolution, the radical hippie freaks like me, when we tried everything, and I am a trier, a doer, and experiencer. A lot of people get into the new age and stuff and they dabble. You know, oh, crystals are fun. You know, I follow that stream to the source. And I drank from the source. And that's when I find out it's poison, all right? But I don't just dabble in anything. So when that Jesus movement came along, all of a sudden, these Jesus freaks are banging on the door saying, let us in, let us in. And too often, the pastor was looking out the door, ah, barbarians, yeah. long-haired people with beards. And, oh, you know, and, and I, was, I experienced that, all right? So I know that... You know, it just almost drove them deeper in. And there were those views, Chuck Smith, Cavalry Chapel in California, and others who embraced and, you know, and brought in. So many of us in leadership today are direct products of the Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. And many who have fallen away, uh, and this will be kind of a theme of the novel I'm working on, have become Samson's. And they kind of yielded to the flesh but, yeah, you know, in this, I don't want to tease you here, but Samson had to have his hair regrown, and he had to have his eyes plucked out, and he, had to, and he went into chains. But he made a last, last push against the pillars and killed more Philistines than that than everything he had done. So a lot of my cry and call is a call on to a Samson generation. All right, and that is, come in, you know, I know... I know, you know, the, the good-looking women might have been your undoing, you know, whatever it was, mm -hmm. you know, of the flesh. But now, let's push against the pillars, and let's kill more in our last final push, even if it kills us, yes. all right? I'm not looking for the safe, happy retirement, all right? 
I, I'm a cowboy that wants to die with my boots on. I'm a warrior that wants to die in battle. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I'm not looking at my writing or at anybody else's as, oh, this is a nice little career field and you'll make enough. You can buy the little cottage and, and live happily ever after. So in saying that, and as we approach what's needed, what I want to see is writing come about where the Christian message is presented in such a way that men and women both want to read it and saved and unsaved both want to read it mm -hmm. and they the classics you know you think back to classic novels uh change cultures uh, uncle tom's cabin okay harriet beecher so supposedly abraham lincoln said to her so you're the little lady that started this great war mm -hmm. all right from one novel uh, <clears throat> harper lee still i mean if you took a general poll in america the, the greatest novel, you know, of the last 200 years would be To Kill a Mockingbird. And men read it, women read it, Christians read it, non-Christians read it. It's a unifier. It unifies, but it's also excellent. It's excellence. Uh, so that's my goal, is to see people rise up and write inspired but serious fiction. And when I say serious, doesn't mean there aren't any laughs in it doesn't mean it's, you know, heavy in tone. It means it's taken seriously. And I want to speak, you know, if you, to that person out there right now, and all of a sudden their head snapped, and they say, yeah, I want to be taken seriously. Yes. Well, to be taken seriously, you have to write seriously. All right? And that doesn't mean take yourself seriously, mm -hmm. but the call, the gift. Now, last week I spoke on, how your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. Realize, though, that John the Baptist's gift got him beheaded. Yes. All right? he, before, he came before great men and lost his head. Mm -hmm. Christ went before great men and was crucified. All right? Now, I'm not putting us quite you know, to that status, but let's look at another one, Nathan and, and David. And Nathan was brought before men because of what? Only that gift that was resident in him. And what did he do? He basically told a story. And he said, King David, there is this man. And this, this man has sheep, lots of little sheep, but he took another man's little sheep. So he approaches it because the story, the parable, the fiction, disarms the rational uh, system the analytical system, and David just jumps ahead of himself and says, well, who is this man? You know, I'll deal with him. And Nathan says, it is you. Yes. All right. Now, my challenge then is where in Christendom, in our novelists, our uh, fiction writers especially, the Nathans, the ones that can tell such a story that great men tremble after they've read it. Mm. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. <laughs> it's sinking but, in. Well, that's my desire. And whether I reach it or not, I don't know. But I want to put that out there and speak into people's lives and say, don't buy this thing that it's all about sales. It's all about being published. It's all about being considered an author. All right. That word means almost nothing to me anymore. And I know you have to use it. <laughs> You know, and it's okay, and people will describe me as one. But in today's self-publishing world and publishing on demand, look at my Facebook friend request. Everybody is an author, mm -hmm. all right? Now, the problem here is author is the root word for authority. So if you're going to be an author, you should be an authority. It's also the root word for authentic. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be an author, you should be considered real. You should be considered authentic. And the, and the other part of that that reaches deep into authority is you have to be accurate. You have to be accurate in your fiction. If you are a woman saying that you want to draw more men to your audience, and the first thing you do in chapter one is just blow it about, say, firearms or about horses, ranching, saddles, you know, something like that, you just totally blow it. You've lost it. 
Mm-hmm. You've lost him. You're, he's not coming back because the, the main thing about the reader and, uh, and the, uh, the author is trust. You're building a trusting relationship. I'm coming to my readers and say, I want you to come on a, a journey with me. And they're going to look at me and say, well, I don't know, you know, and, and they might not distrust me, but they just wonder if the journey's going to be worth it. Yes. I'm busy. I got a lot of things to do. You know, is this, you know, and, and with men, it's different, right? We're hunter gatherers, you know, we're all warriors of some sort. And guess what? There's no place to go to discover a new land. We can't go all go to outer space. That's right. All right. And I mean, we've had generations of people launching out and discovering, you know, new lands and, you know, whatever goes with it. Much of it's good. Much of it was bad. But that's the nature of man. We don't have to over politicize any of this. And that's why you have to be accurate about your history. Know your history and don't launch into some political correct anew that has holes in it and try and shoot the rapids because people are going to just notice that lack of authenticity. The cowboy world especially. See, we're raised being subjected to and knowing about dudes. And dudes isn't something cool from the 80s, you know, from stoner movies of, hey, you know, hey, dude, all right? We're, we're, we're raised with people want, pretending they're us, all right? We're raised with pretense trying to, you know what it is, but we're not such snowflakes that it bothers us. It's cultural appropriation. Mm. And the whole snowflake world is running around, you know, the politically correct crowd and yelling about cultural appropriate. Well, cowboys have been culturally appropriated for decades and decades and all going back to the 1880s at least. And we're not whining and crying about it, but we do a resent it at times. When it's literally, when it's, I can look at an ad, like on television, there's one presently for an insurance, car insurance company, supposedly cowboys in this car. They're the biggest jokes, fakers, actors, but I can tell in the glance by how they wear their hat, all right? And any cowboy can. He can glance at somebody and how they're wearing their hat tells them if they're really a cowboy or they just bought that hat at Walmart. I've heard that before. Yeah. And so as a reader, uh, you, you pick up on something, you say they're not wearing the hat right. Mm-hmm. I had a, a rancher friend call me a couple winters ago, and a, a rather noted writer, a Montana writer, had wrote a book about ranching. And this guy called me up, and uh, he's a rancher, believe me. And, and he, his sister had given him this book. And he goes, John, he says, this is good writing, but when are you going to release another book? Because this guy had made a couple big mistakes, you know, about ranching. And this is a Montana author, but he went into that ranching cowboy world and he made a couple of mistakes that exposed him. So first of all, be accurate, you know, at firearms thing, especially if you're going, you know, to, I don't know how many Christians should write thrillers, first of all, because I don't know if their own life is very thrilling. You know, I mean, and I don't mean that in a belittling way, but look at the top thriller writers in America today. Uh, My favorite, Daniel Silva. And Daniel Silva writes intense, deep books. They're beautifully written. You learn about art and art restoration. You learn about the Catholic Church because he restores so much art there. You learn about the nation of Israel. And yes, he's an assassin. All right. And Daniel Silva, uh, when you see him interviewed on TV, he knows so much about the state of the world Mm -hmm. that he could advise politicians. And, and, And Brad Thor does, if you read Brad Thor. I mean, he actually belongs to Security Council type meetings. Uh, And Brad, uh, Mr. I haven't met him, I shouldn't be so familiar, but Brad Thor's probably one problem is he's so patriotic that there's an urgency that comes across in his book that is a little distracting. That is atmosphere. All right. That's a part of atmosphere because atmosphere is tuned and I mean, tone and tune and, uh, 
mood. It's a lot of different elements. And, and for a Christian, we deal with a completely different view of atmosphere because we know that air, you know, there's another dimension. Yes. And we don't have to get all wooly about it. But we understand there's an invisible world. And that there are angels and demons and, you know, and we probably shouldn't get too far out there trying to describe that stuff and, unless you've lived it. I've lived it. I lived it before I came to the Lord. I've lived it since. I had a supernatural life. I've moved in the gifts of the Spirit. I've, I've seen miracles. I was miraculously healed of a terminal disease. And it's all on record. I got stacks of medical records this high. Okay. So with me, it's not theory. Mm -hmm. But I don't write about it yet. For the same reason that men that have seen combat don't talk about it, mm -hmm. and they will only talk about it to other men who have seen combat. Yes, yes. Because if you haven't been there, you won't understand it. Mm -hmm. So there are people who are right now wanting to write, you know, supernatural thrillers. And people like me who have led a supernatural life, I've had demonized people try to strangle me twice, you know, and that's just part of, you know, if you if you minister where other people won't, all right, these things will happen. Yes. Okay. I mean, it just takes that. That's all it is. I'm nothing. I'm not silly adventurer. I'm not doing it because I need a you know a cheap thrill. Yeah. I had plenty of those in my life, you know. Mm -hmm. But but if you go into, and it can be your own home, all right. But if you accept those people that the rest of the church is scared of. You know, then something like this is going to happen, and you're qualified then to write about it. Doesn't mean you should write about it. Mm -hmm. And see, I haven't been released to. Now, the difference here, as far as atmosphere and authority, if I write about it, I'll write about it with authority. Mm -hmm. And I'll write from an atmosphere that I can remember what it was like having those fingers around my neck. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a clue it's not nearly as melodramatic as it sounds. Both cases, the strength was supernatural, mm -hmm. but the hands could not close because that's the grace of God. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if you didn't know and have been through that, you'd probably try and make it melodramatic. Oh, I was cutting off my hair. And I, you know, and, and those of us who have been there saying, you've never been there. You know, you've never been there. So why not write what you know? Yes. yes. All right. Why don't you get back to writing? what you know. Let me check Facebook because I am absolutely sure that we have questions and comments. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Katie says, um, uh, greets Richard Rossi. Nick Phil Nikki Phillips says she agrees with you. And um, Katie Rouse says, hello from Alabama. Hello, Katie. Thanks for being here. Uh, Nikki Phillips also says, I hope to read something of yours someday that explores your supernatural experiences. So she's interested. When and if you write something, she's interested in having access to it. Hmm. All right. Thank you for that. And by the way, viewers, this is going to run, probably going to run a little bit long. So that's, we knew that going in. I just failed to mention it to you. So, so glad you're here. All right. Thank you, John. So where should we go from now, Patricia? Um, <clears throat> let's talk a little more about of uh, um when i when i mentioned to you about authority and this topic i mentioned love and respect that the husband should love the wife and the wife is called to respect the husband mm -hmm. if uh women want to reach a male audience they have to understand that now why did paul say that because we know we're the word says perfected in our weaknesses. That's not, doesn't mean that we're perfect. Again, it means we're complete. That word means complete. It doesn't mean perfect because nobody's perfect except Christ. But we're completed by the work in our weaknesses. For fear and trembling, you'll work out the salvation of your soul. And it's by the engrafted word that you work out the salvation of your soul. So it is in that process that we become complete. So he said, men, love your wives because he knows knew that love is hard for us mm -hmm. and also because we discern something that women don't we don't get so ooey gooey messy with it true all right 
All right. We've noticed. <laughs> all right. We understand that all love is not God's love. Okay. Now that's going to, sh- you know, what? You know, my shake. Yeah, explain that to us. Well, there's all kinds of love that's born out of human flesh that hasn't been redeemed yet. It's unredeemed love. Just to say that it's love, you know, you know, it's, is it sacrificial love? Or does it edify you? Yes. All right. Does it justify you? Does it make you feel good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Then it's born out of human flesh. And one of the main ones you see anymore is a, is a frustrated maternal instinct. And you see this more and more and more because uh, just the way abortion is part of it, you know, that whole thing. Uh, it, oh, Lord. Talk about Nathan, about, you know, no, I'm John. I'll probably be John the Baptist. Uh, I'll probably be beheaded, you know, before the day is through. But if you want to be bold and real in today's world as a Christian, if you, and this better be come from women, all right, because if it comes from guys like me, it's going to fall on so many deaf ears of people that can't hear it. Yeah. And they're conditioned by the world to, oh, you're just a man. You know, I mean, even Christians, we have these prejudices, these biases. And, but the, the, one of the greatest dangers, and when I see it in novels, I mean, I just, I'll burn it. I'm so, I, I throw it away. I'll burn it. I, uh, and that's anthropomorphism, the ascribing of human traits to animals. Mm-hmm. Now, that's fine if we're being allegorical. It's fine if we're writing a cartoon book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But we are, because of this misplaced maternal instinct, you know, we're getting into these areas where we're bordering on animal worship. Mm-hmm. Now, honestly, you say, oh, John, that's so extreme. Can you be a prophet of God and not tell the church when they're approaching idolatry? All right. Should, da- should Nathan have just son- come before David and said, hey, King David, <laughs> boy, have a great day. I hope you just have a blessed day. Oh, and say hi to Bathsheba for me when you see her. Got to go. Got to go. Peace and mercy. Blessing upon you. All right. Where is that prophetic voice in our novelist that is willing to not just call a sin a sin, which is hard enough, but to also point out that sin and iniquity are not the same thing. And we're getting into areas in our nation of just flat out iniquity. Now, sin means missing the mark. But you can go back and get that arrow, because it's archer's term, and fire it again. All right? Iniquity means you have bent yourself. You are bent. You're perverted. It's perversion. And that arrow doesn't fly, period. Yes. All right? So we play around with sin while allowing in iniquity. And we need to, we need to get serious because it's serious times. Yes. Do we live in serious times? All right. Uh, I don't write for amusement. You know why? Amusement's not a good word. Go back and trace the origin. Basically, basically it means to kind of stare vacantly. All right. I think it, uh, I mean, word scientists, guys, they disagree with, with this, but I think it actually means without inspiration because it's a, like asexual, meaning without, and muse, meaning the muse, the inspiration. But they say that's not true, but it has all these other meanings, and they're basically not that good. Most of it is to actually, it's a sleight of hand. All right. It's to direct and distract attention. You know, uh-huh. slide a hand that a pickpocket would do. Bump you, and you and you look away, and he picks your pocket. Mm-hmm. But what I don't like about just amusement writing is the the word says redeem the time, because the days are evil. Okay, so I'm not into killing time. Mm-hmm. Reading something just to kill time, because time will kill you in mm-hmm. that process. We don't have the time for that mm-hmm. now. Next step up is entertainment. That word's not quite as bad in its origin, but again, it's kind of a distraction type thing. Okay, so I'm not. I'm, I'm wanting to entertain and that I involve myself, 
But really, the next step up is recreation. And we don't think about riding as recreation because we think recreation now is outdoors, outdoor recreation, yeah. recreation in parks, you know, all right? Yeah. But no, the original word means recreate. So mm -hmm. when you're depleted, you're tired, you're discouraged, you need to recreate, all right? Now, uh, <clears throat> I've never read Jan Carrick, right? but my wife has, and my wife is a very good reader, and she doesn't like fluff. She likes good escapist stuff if it's recreational, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, she, we, early this morning over coffee, I mean, she just almost got teary-eyed about Jan Karen. And, and she, you know, she knows that I respect excellence. You know, I respect brilliance. I respect mm -hmm. effort. And she's in depth. I, ex I, I want deep, deep, deep stuff yeah. in a palatable way. Because mm -hmm. deep calls on to deep. If I'm going to get deep with you, I'm going to call on to your depth. It's going to draw out my depth. Mm -hmm. If I want to just be shallow, I'll say, hey, Patricia. How's the weather? How's the kids? I don't really care, but I'm, you know, I'm asking because yeah. that's what society tells us to do. But really, you know, I'm more fascinated with me. And let's get back to talking about me. Okay. But deep, deep is I want to know when I'm around people, how can I heal your wound mm -hmm. in Christ? All right. That's all I really care about. I'm not too much into shallow stuff. And my wife, who's been, you know, has all these experiences with me of inner healing and, you know, all of this deep cleansing work. And she says, Jan Karen knows about deep healing mm. and knows how to do it. But the other thing she knows how to do, which is a part of atmosphere and leads into authority is a sense of place. Midford is a sense of place. And most writing doesn't have a sense of place because you are not where you are. You're somewhere else. Mm, right. Back up now. What's your name? <laughs> Most Christians are not where they are. They're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly planted. All right, so they're off here. They're with the kids. They've got this to do. They got that to do. They don't understand. I, have, I sent a package to some spiritual parents of mine years ago. And uh, after about two weeks, you know, they didn't get it. And I checked with them. Well, the next door neighbor had it. I was off by a digit. And they had lived there for a year or two. You know, in a nice, nice uh, neighborhood in a larger city. And they didn't even know their neighbors yet. And these are godly people. But they move so much, they have no roots. And if you're always moving, you're not going to know about a sense of place very well. Mm. All right. Now, here's the key on a sense of place. And I'm going to get back to Jan in a minute. Okay. Stay there, Jan. We want to see that book. Okay. All right. This is the one my wife had. We have so many books. She'll hate me for this. We have so many books. She had to crawl under our bed to pull the, the, these out because we have no place left to put them. All right. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we got them stacked, stocked, and stacked up in Tupperware boxes. You know, over in the bunkhouse. But um, sounds wonderful to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it keeps it broke. Um, <clears throat> But Christians move around so much, they don't follow, you know, maybe they're not reading James again, and don't say you'll go to this city or that city and make a profit, because Lord only knows, you know, you're just a little breath of air, you're just grass that's going to grow, wither, and die. You're dust, baby. You're nothing but dust in the wind. <laughs> and you get back to that old song. But that's what we are, and so we can't presume that we're always moving, and we've lost community. See, what Jan Mithard obviously knows is community. What I like about small towns, I was offered a job with the, New York, uh, with the uh, Denver Post when I was 19 years old, mm -hmm. and I turned it down because I wanted to hitchhike and travel and be in the country, but I did not want to live in a big city. I didn't care about promotion and career and all that. I did not want to live in a big city. How many Christians just take a job because it's upward advancement? They never pray about it. They never think about it. All right. They just go. They never have a sense of place. You know, they, if, if you do that, it's not just Christians, of course, it's, it's everybody. We're in that mobile type of community. So part of having authority is knowing where you are and knowing and not presuming, you know. I mean, I got more people that moved to Mile City, Montana, the cow capital of the world, one of the famous cow towns. Gus McRae died here. Now, if you don't know who Gus McRae is, this interview's over. Got to go.
But you see, that's kind of a litmus test, uh, you know, because who was Gus McRae? Well, who was Woodrow Call? Okay. Lois oh, oh, that's who you're talking about. When you put Larry the names together, Richard. I'm like, yeah. All right. Okay. Did you know, and I'll still jam, I am coming back. <laughs> Did you know that, and you know, Larry McMurtry grew up on a hard scrabble ranch in Texas, you know, so he knows sense of place, he knows ranching, he knows the cattle industry. But Lonesome Dove, as great of a book as it was, Pulitzer Prize winner, the, the, the television series did not win an Emmy that year, which is totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that, that, uh, that book, Lonesome Dove, is primarily based on a nonfiction book called Log of a Cowboy by Andy Adams. And if you read Andy Adams, you see the scenes from Lonesome Dove that Larry McMurtry took. You know, and that's okay, all right? He didn't pleasurize anything. You know, he was researching. You know, he was doing research and stuff. You know, and that's okay. It, it, I know I thought he went a little overboard because I mean, sometimes it's drugs. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's uh, when the two Irish, when that Irishman drowns in the river, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Andy Adams just writes it out in detail, you know, but at least he was authentic. I mean, Lonesome Dove had power because uh, it was so largely authentic. Now, Mr. Yurick, who, uh, you know, played Jake Spoon, didn't have a cowboy look. No. There's no. a cowboy look, all right. Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, these guys from Boston, uh, you know, anybody from that big inner city type of stuff, they just can't, no matter how good of an actor they are, they just don't have that because they don't have the atmosphere. So mm -hmm. you don't breathe in the atmosphere and the lack of atmosphere gives them a lack of authority. Yes, yes. See, they don't seem that. authentic. I see that. So, yeah. Now, I'll get the, should, should we visit Jan? Yes. Uh, what I actually want to read <clears throat> is the, the flap here on the front cover describing the book and it says Jan Karen's series of refreshing all right again like recreational recreate refreshing not entertaining mm -hmm. not amusing refreshing because you're going to get reinvigorated mm -hmm. and deeply affecting not shallow not superficial and having an effect on you okay set in the high green hills of, of Mitford. So sense of place, mm -hmm. understanding that sense of place has captured the hearts of millions, which it had mostly women, but still hearts of millions. Isn't that what you want to do? Yes, I do. I mean, isn't it what you want to do? And she presents Christ through it. You know, according to my wife, she's excellent at, at weaving the message in there without preaching. So your sense of place is so important. If you don't have sense of place, you do not have any authority. You're a tourist. All right. So can we get that from strictly from research or must we have lived that um, in, in that place, in that uh, place in our mind or physically go and move there? What are you suggesting there? How far do we go? I, I think largely you have to live there. Now, you don't, again, for, we live in this strange world where they want to tell you there's no absolutes. And then you, if you generalize, you know, then I get all this, these messages of, uh, well, that's not true, you know, because they know one exception. Yeah, and then yeah. they, so what they're telling you is there are no absolutes, except you absolutely shall not generalize. <laughs> I deal in trends. See, I see trends. I see big pictures. All right. If you want me to, I can get into the weeds. You know, I can look for the exceptions. But, mm -hmm. but everybody wants to play the devil's advocate today. And you, you present the trend, you know. And, oh, no, I know somebody who, you know. And I mm -hmm. thought, good, you know. And it is a, a spirit of criticism, a negative kind of spirit operating. But so I always have to qualify and say, okay, I'm speaking generally because I'm talking about trends, movements of God, you know, di dispensations of the spirit, moving through the arts, moving through, you know, whatever, leading towards what I hope is, you know, a great end time awakening, larger than the first awakening. I mean, that is, that's, that's my heart's desire, and it has to be done by a sovereign move of God because you and I are not big enough. 
mm -hmm. and we don't have enough zeal and fire. You know, we're pretty little fellows here down on this planet, and it's only Christ within us that is the hope of glory. So, now, <clears throat> I'll go back just a minute in, in how God creates his sense of authority and atmosphere in his story, and history again means his story, right? Mm -hmm. So this is all his story, and even us, uh, I, you know, he's the author and, and hopefully the finisher of my faith. I hope it be finished in him and not finished in me, okay? So it's all what he's writing, and when does he do certain things? Now, I was in the whole CBA world, and my books were being published, and all of this largely in that outbreak of fiction in the Christian world starting about 1990. All right, it was 1990 to about 2000, and there was one book in particular that sparked it all, and that was Frank Peretti's This Present Darkness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anybody reading today, you know, writing today should read it. Now, is it a great book? Uh, it's not wonderfully written because Frank was not a writer. Frank's talent was oral presentation. Mm -hmm. He was a dramatist. He was, a, you know, he was theatrical. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it was, you know, so no, you can pick it apart. I mean, it's very readable. But how much of that was the editing? Now, it came to Crossway in a slush pile. We hardly have slush piles anymore. Mm -hmm. And for anybody out there, you know, who's not a writer and you don't know what it is, that's all those unsolicited manuscripts that come to a publisher and they pile up and they have these very, very, very junior editors. They're kind of chained to a desk and they feed them about once a day. who have to sit there and pour over all of this stuff that's mostly drivel, you know, and eagle mania, you know, coming forth. Mm -hmm. Well, they discover Frank Peretti. Frank Peretti writes this present darkness. It shocks the Christian world, yeah. sells over three million copies, you know, in a rather short period of time. And you can say, well, it's, you know, it's not great literature. And his books descended after that. Piercing the darkness was pretty strong. But after that, he went back to his strength, which was simply oral. I mean, if you see Frank Peretti act out scenes for children, I mean, he gets into the whole thing, you know, you know, and that's the way he was trying to write at the end to where even in one of his last books in capital letters, there'd be zam, bam, pow, wow. Just like an old Batman, you know, if you remember the old Batman TV series, and wham, bam, pow. Well, it didn't work, you know, and his sales went way down. But now I might, you know, you sound like I'm meaning to be critical, but here's, 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 here's what's so powerful about this. What did Frank Peretti's book really do? Why was, you know, and I'm presuming to be God here for a second, all right, lightning bolts, okay? And that is, what did, what was the purpose, really? It wasn't to entertain you. It wasn't to amuse you. Because good fiction does what? It suspends the belief system. The reader picks it up. Well, I'm just going to check out now because here in the God of America isn't really the, the Trinity isn't the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I wish it were, but we're Roman and Greek, and it's Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. And we're going to put everything through that Trinity. Well, this doesn't make sense, and I don't think, you know. And so if we're reading it didactically, a nonfiction book, and if Frank had written a book about spiritual warfare, and it was all nonfiction, you know, most of these husbands would say, oh, I don't know about that, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. But he writes fiction, and they go, and they relax. They breathe out mm -hmm. atmosphere, atmosphere, okay? Mm -hmm. They breathe out disbelief, because it takes work to be critical. It takes work to have all those guards up, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to, all right? They mm -hmm. breathe that out. They sit down, and they read this book, of angels and demons, the demons being centered in a college, which resonated with almost all of us, and <clears throat> fighting over the soul of a, a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it opened up and explained to people the power of prayer and gave life to intercessors, which almost wasn't a term before that. Mm -hmm. You know, that there was a separate group called intercessors. Mm -hmm. And it's not a Ephesians 4.11 office or anything like that. But we know there are people called to intercession. We're all called to pray, and we're all called to intercede. But there are those, you know, that that's them. 
Yeah. That's them. Yeah. That's their life. So what Frank Peretti's book did that was so much greater than my criticisms of style and blah, 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 was he opened the door for people to believe in warfare, spiritual warfare, especially over your town. And what followed his book in the nonfiction sense but John Dawson, Taking Our Cities for God, mm -hmm. which got accepted. Now, would that have been accepted if Frank Peretti hadn't wrote This Present Darkness? Mm -hmm. So you see, the good fiction writer is the prophet going before, the voice in the wilderness saying, prepare ye the way. Uh -huh. That's what, why Christ spoke in parables, you know, because we, language is just simply symbols of thought, mm -hmm. and it can't capture everything. So people speaking just factually are going to fall a little short, and the, the person speaking in parables simply takes symbols and brings symbols together, all right? And we can all relate differently to those symbols, but it speaks that same truth to us. And that's why the fiction writer should be foremost, you know, in, in educating the body and preparing the bride, all right? But if we're only trying to amuse, mm -hmm. and if we're only trying to entertain, and if we're only trying to distract, who distracts? The enemy distracts. Yeah. Christ is very direct. You don't say, Jesus said, hey, look at that, while he, you know, steals your wallet. That's right. And he's very direct. So this diversionary tactic and everything isn't coming from the Lord. So now <clears throat> he had right. a sense of place. I second, I second. Let me check Facebook, <laughs> please. You get a drink. Let me check Facebook. Uh, let's see what we've got. Bill Yaunt, maybe. Forgive yeah. me if I'm mispronouncing this. Uh, thanks, John, for taking the time for me to begin to learn how to write. Still learning. I won't forget you. Uh, so obviously there's a relationship here. Um, and we honor that. Nikki says, love the word studies. And she also says, all love is not God's love. She thinks that's such a such good thing. And then Pam now is uh, watching from Canada. So good to have you here. Thank you for joining us, Pam. Uh, let me check one other place also, because sometimes I get, I get other comments in a different if I approach it differently okay I think we're good I think we're good all right we're back okay, one on. last word on sense of place <clears throat> and, and developing one well two last words number one you do not define the sense of place going back to kind of your question uh -huh. you know can we just research it do we have to live there you do not define the sense of place the sense of place defines you uh -huh. All right. If I say Garrison Keeler, people say Lake Wobegon. Lake Wobegon. All right. See, Lake Wobegon has come to define him. Okay. All right. You get so, again, the gift makes room for you until, you know, because the gift is bigger than you. The sense of place makes room for you. Because it's bigger than you. If you try and just research it and do this and do that, you're making yourself bigger than the place and it'll sound like that. All right? It's all about you and, hey, look what I know about this. All right? The place is bigger than you because guess what? Miles City, Montana was here before I was born. It's going to be here after I die. Mm -hmm. All right? It defines me. I don't define it. And so are you saying that if we live in a southern town, we need to write about southern towns? <clears throat> Not necessarily, but no, whatever you write about may have a southern town flavor. Okay. okay. And now the problem is becoming provincial to where we see just that whole world, you know, through that. And we limit ourselves to being a regional writer, which people considered William Faulkner, you know, a regional writer. <laughs> uh, so some of that we have no control over. I, I might be considered regional in the sense that I am so authentic and true to history that my loyalist base is old cowboys who just respect me so much. And again, what does a man want? I don't want love from all these old cowboys, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. you know, and that's the female thing. Oh, I want them to love me. No, I want them to respect me. Um, because a man is wired that way. I have to learn and practice love because it's not natural for me. Now, think of this. Two boxers before a fight. Two males before a fight. 
and they're in their face, staring at each other, trash talking. They beat on each other for 12 rounds. They're bloody. They're messed up, all right? What do they do at the end? They usually hug each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They earned respect. Listen to this. That's what that means? Yes. They earned respect. You cannot, you cannot demand respect. And that's where men get screwed up and they mess up women who then come back as in, you know, angry women writing angry books, hating men. You can, I cannot demand that you respect me. Mm-hmm. I can't say, you're dissing me, man. You know, and say, you, I command respect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Respect is a gift okay. that you give me because I'm worthy of it. Yes. I can't demand it because I'm insecure. Now you're you're disrespecting me. All right. If I respect if I move in a certain way, I command respect. Yes. What comes with that? Authority. Yes. All right. You walk in commanding respect, you have authority. What does that do? That changes atmospheres. The light is coming on. <laughs> All right. That changes atmospheres. You see, you, so you don't change atmospheres by your little idea of this little thing. I want a little sentimentality here. Oh, a little sanctimony here would be nice. Uh-huh. You change it by the power of your being. You change it by who you are. The reader is going to know who you are by reading your book. And if you're a phony, they might be amused by it and amused by the story. You won't change their lives. You won't change their atmosphere. Now... Oh, I could go on forever. But now, where you write influences the atmosphere. I could mention a friend of mine who is one of the most powerful men of God in the world, and certainly in the United States, and his books sell a lot, all right? And he, like a lot of these guys, always want to try and push the envelope and see if they're literary. You know, he's writing very clear communicative books. Yeah. But they're biblically based, and I mean, they're wonderful. They're wonderful. And he, he has a way of communicating, and he's self-debasing. You know, he, he doesn't promote himself. You know, he's a wonderful man of God. But he wanted to see if he, you know, was literary and kind of did a bunch of essays. And when, you're, when you have a name like him, the publisher will publish your grocery list, if you want, because they know your name is going to sell. I mean, they're businessmen. And I mean, I don't agree with that, but I mean, they trotted it out there kind of stuff and it fell kind of flat. And there was two reasons. Number one, and another friend of mine, a cowboy poet did this. And again, a man who's been on national television, including, you know, Johnny Carson and, you know, I mean, big name guy really in his world, you know, and he did the same thing and tried to write a book of essays and they both fell flat for one reason in their essays they didn't have a strong ending. They had this nice beginning and a good story, and the ending just sort of tailed off and died. Mm-hmm. Part of authority is wham. When you close the door, you close the door, but you've closed the door into a whole new world. You've locked your reader into a whole new world and established an atmosphere for them for the rest of the day. They're going to be walking around saying, where am I? Where am I? If you tail it off, you disappoint them. Yes. And you lose authority. And they go, well, you know, you're, you were a good writer, except you didn't know how to end the book. Mm-hmm. All right. So when I saw him, and I didn't want to be too critical, he sells in the millions. I sell, you know, in the negative fours or something. So I didn't, you know, but I told him because I don't mind being a prophet in this area, because to me, writing is worship. Writing is worship? Writing is act of worship for me. That is powerful, John. Well, it's just a reality. See, I don't even think it's powerful. I've it been is. a professional writer. I've gotten paychecks for it. I've been the journalist. I've been all these other things. But I know who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm not just even a hack, you know. I mean, there are hacks out there. And let's call a hack a hack. All right? We promote them, you know. Oh, you've written so many books, you know. Blah, 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 you know? And you know, and that's fine. I'm not judging them for that. It may sound like it, but I'm not judging them. That's their life choice. Okay. But I can't do that because 
Porno the word pornography means prostitute writing. That's what the word means, okay? But you see, if I were to write for money or write for anything other than the fact that I feel like I'm worshiping God and what I'm doing, I would be writing pornography. I'd be selling out. Mm -hmm. See, I'd be selling my gift. I'd be, I'd be a merchant in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And Christ would have to come overturn my table. Now, I'm not saying that my writing is on this highest levels of you know, worship, which, by the way, if you're not on your face, you're not worshiping, but that's a whole different thing. That's just breaking down that word, all right? But let's say that to me, it's a sacrament, all right? Writing to me is a sacrament. It is something I am taking and offering up to God and wanting Him to bless, to touch others, all right? It's not just about, you know, I'm so passionate because it's beyond me, all right? It's not, it's not all about me. I'm passionate because I want others to catch the vision. I want others to follow. I want others to go past me. A good spiritual father isn't trying to build his little castle and have a bunch of servants. He is trying to be a pioneer into the promised land, you know, come up against the Hittites, the Malachites, and all the other tites, and drive them out and make a place for his children to prosper. Yes. And that's yeah. what, you know, my goal in writing is stretch the borders, stretch the borders out, conquer the beasts, conquer the savages, and create a place. Now, one other thing. Getting back especially to atmosphere is Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship, created beforehand for good works, all right? That word workmanship is a Greek word poema, from which we get the word poem. So if you want to play with that a little, you can say we are his poem. Well, what kind of poem are you? Are you doggerel? Do you know what the term doggerel means? Are you a bucolic? We've got a lot of bucolics, yeah. all right? A lot of bucolic books, a lot of bucolic covers. So that means that your poem is a bucolic, which basically that word means you're a shepherd of oxes. So get up in the morning and go get an ox, which is actually a draft animal, but they also milked them there because they were dual purpose. So that means that you're going to get up in the morning and go milk your cow. All right. <laughs> if that's your poem. And that's what so much of the nostalgia in the body of Christ is all about. I want the pastoral scenes, the word pastor, past, pasture, like my cattle pastures, which oh. might be, you know, I might have one pasture that's 8,000 acres. Mm -hmm. All right. Because it's rough and, you know, it's badlands. That's where we get the word pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, mm -hmm. all right? It's from pasture, because it's about taking the sheep to good grazing. Oh, oh, okay. All right? So we have to understand what all these words mean and what you, kind of poem you are. But the essence of that poem is we have to go, what was a poem in biblical times? Because you had minstrels and bards, and they wrote poetry, and they sang poetry, and they... they uh, played instruments, and the word, one word for prophet, nabi, is actually the same word there for, pro, for poet. Mm -hmm. So the poet there was a prophet in that he was singing out and speaking out the inspired word of God as David did with the Psalms, okay? So that's the kind of poetry that he was. Mm -hmm. And I can be a little critical in my area out here of cowboy poetry, because too often you know, it's, it's not fully expressed in seriousness, you know, and it's, it's kind of dumbed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And rap music's the same thing. Rap music is, you know, it's supposed to be poetry, but it's, you know, really not very inspired or edifying. It, it has a basic bestial meat, beat, all right? It responds to a kind of a thing in us. Now, <clears throat> we are meant to be a poem, but we're not meant to be today's poem. And the problem is too many Christian books are 150 pages of Hallmark greeting cards, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the level of their po the, the poetry that's coming out of them. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. All right? I don't want to be okay. I want to be wounded, bloody, suffering, and conquering. All right? Mm -hmm. I want to win. I want to conquer. But I don't want to conquer without some wounds. In the military, the most prestigious award that you wear is called the CIB, the Con Combat Infantry Men's Badge. And it means you've been in combat. You might have a bronze star, you might have a silver star, you might have a couple purple hearts. Mm -hmm. But first of all, you have to have the CIB. 
You have to be in combat before you can get wounded. Yes. All right. So now the other thing here, and I know we're getting up to that time. I'm trying to, you know, sum up a, a little bit. But in being that poem, now how do you really want to write and write and write deep and touch people? Here's the key. And it has a lot to do with authority because there's your authority will come out of this. But it's really about atmosphere. Where do you write? Like I told my friend, getting back to his story, because I said, I, you know, I told him, you wrote that in an airport terminal. And he goes, what? How did you know? That's where I, that's where I write. I said, you can't write literature in an airport terminal. Because um... it's a gift. You know, it's a sacrament. Now, yeah, you can if you go through all the cleansing you're probably going to need, you know, to do it, and all the distractions that are there around you. But where you write is vitally important because that comes through the atmosphere. I can sometimes read a book and I know what kind of atmosphere it was written in because it's coming through the book. Now, granted, I'm going to hear right now, you know, in the spirit realm, I hear ladies say, well, you don't understand. I've got three kids, and I've got a barking dog, and I, la, 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 la. Well, I do understand, but here's what you do. Your gift makes room for you. You don't make room for the gift. You don't squeeze out five minutes here and five minutes there and confuse your notes for the novel with the grocery list. So pretty soon, you know, you have Fruit Loops barking over here. Uh, you, you make room for it. You do get up at 4 a.m. Yeah, you're tired, all right? But I've edited and wrote many books between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. And again, between 8 o'clock at night and 10 o'clock at night. And I made that sacrifice because the gift is bigger than I am. If I tried to squeeze it in just through the course of the day, that's the way it would look. It would look mm -hmm. like something I squeezed in. Now, next, a poem should be lyrical. It should have a beat. Really good writing has a rhythm. You get into a rhythm. Uh, <clears throat> I hate to talk about shooting a basketball in case you have Shan, you know, Ray on, who was, you know, a professional basketball player. And he's Einstein when it comes to basketball. And I'm Gomer Pyle. All right. <laughs> but I do know how to shoot properly. I was a shooter, known as a shooter. And I had muscle memory. I did it so much. I could do it with my eyes closed. I could, I could score, you know, not in games, but, you know, in practice and stuff. I didn't have to. I could close my eyes. And I could feel, you know, where I was. Muscle memory, I could shoot. I had all the right mechanics. I went through, you know, training myself, first through a good coach, to know where my elbow should be, where my hand should be, how my, you know, should my follow through. I knew all that. Softness of touch, you know, the rotation of the ball, all of that. Now, you do that long enough. And what happens? One day, you fall into the zone. Mm -hmm. yeah. fall into the zone that's what every athlete's looking for the zone and you can't miss that one day everything you throw up is going in because you can't miss you're in poetry see you're dancing with the game you're one with the game you're spinning and dancing truth and mercy must marry one rendering of that says truth and mercy must kiss all right mm -hmm. and you are truth and mercy the truth parts the mechanics all the mechanics and the practice. The mercy is the grace of God saying, have fun. Have fun. Dance with this. Now, as a writer, that's where you want to go. I could tell you, and I'm hardwired for this, so you got to do more push-ups. You got to do more push-ups. You know, get down there and do more. You know, I, want you to, I want you to just I, 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 you memorize the entire dictionary. <laughs> all right, then read all the great classics. And I want you to pray for 14 hours a day, and you'll write a good book. All right, push ups, push ups, push ups, push ups. And you just, you become muscle bound and you never get to dance. All right, mm -hmm. you never get to the dance. And what this is really about in, in literature is you want to release the dance. You want to get in the dance. You want others to come into the dance. Mostly you want to dance with him. He's the creator. He gave you the gift. The created, creativity is flowing through you. And guess what? You might write all night. Mm -hmm. You might start at, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And the next time you check, it's 3 o'clock in the morning because you were in the zone mm -hmm. and you were producing. My best poem was written in about 1 minute and 15 seconds. And it's been published in anthologies and you name it. One of my best essays, which I put on the web here a couple, of years, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I, I published it 30 years ago. 
wrote it 30 years ago. I wrote that in about three minutes, and it's a eulogy to my mentor, Gordy Spear. All right. Uh, most of my best journalism are eulogies because they're, that's where the love comes in. Yes. Now, say I wrote one about a friend of mine that was a great bronc rider. His name was Bill Pauley. He never won the world championship, but everybody called him the champion without the buckle. He spent you know, so much time at home being a family man and father that he didn't hit the road as much as he should. But he had such great style. You know, he was so good at what he did that people called him a champion without the buckle. I wrote a eulogy, you know, for, for him that appeared in national publications, and it had such a wonderful symbolism in it and a wonderful flow. And it flowed out of me, out of my love and respect for him. See, because love is not all this ooey-gooey, sentimental, pet my puppy, all right? I am so tired of people's puppies. I used to travel, you know, and have to stay in people's homes. You want to see what a lack of authority is? All of these people with spoiled pets and spoiled children. They have no authority within their home. So how do they expect to have it in their book? Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, you got to live it and practice it. But again, poema, deep calling on to deep. One last thing, I hope, because I know you're running out of time, okay. is you've got to create a deep well in you and store, you know, carve out flesh, carve out flesh, carve out flesh, get the spirit in, get soulful. We're so worried about being soulish that we want to allow ourselves to be soulful. So you've got to fill the soul up. Good reading, good reading, good, more good reading, better reading, nonfiction, fiction, you know, everything. But one last thing, music. Now, I don't have a musical bone in my body. My wife has it, my mother and my, some, you know, the bottom side of my pedigree, as we horse breeders would say, you know, has it. I'm just kind of devoid of music, but I've learned to have meter and rhyme, you know, meter in my, my prose and, and to understand flow. But guess what? One of the things that can trigger you to, to write is certain music. Now, don't just think it's going to be a, a pure tool. You're going to turn on, you know, praise and worship music, and God's going to say, oh, thank you, I'll let you write now. It has to be something that speaks to your soul according to your project. You don't write while the music's on. You listen to it. You soak it in. The then, then you go write. And for me right now, the one it is, is actually the theme music from the old television series Justified, which was a pretty raw, tough, you know, movie series set in Kentucky, written by originally Elmore Leonard, who was a very accomplished writer of both westerns and crime books, mm -hmm. and the uh, one, the the rendering of Sandy Loveless, of uh, <clears throat> You'll Never Leave Harlan Alive, and I have my father was born in Kentucky, and my good friend Ray Hughes who Write down that name, everybody, because if you want to be, you know, the deepest man that I know, and uh, everybody should study is Ray Hughes. Well, his father and my father were born about 20 miles apart, and so was William Branham. So all of these, you know, is right there. So Kentucky comes out of my DNA when I listen to that song about you'll never leave Harlan alive. And even though I'm in Montana, and I'm going to write a book of redemption in it, I'm going to have enough grit and reality in it and enough of that fighting Scots-Irish flavor that it colors where I go without imposing anything on my work, all right? It accents it, but you don't let music impose. That work is yours. Now, I keep saying one last thing. There are no one last, but here is it. Here it is. People will tell you lots of stuff at writers' conferences that you can throw out. And it's just echoes. It may not even be pertinent, all right? And I've done it. I'm speaking from experience. Because one thing is they'll say, oh, you got to know your market, know who you're writing for. And, you know, and that makes sense, except it's not true. I write for me. I only have one person to please. I'll have other people read it as I'm writing it and tell me if I'm going wrong. But I write for me. I don't give a rip about the rest of that. I'm not sitting there, I'm writing for these people here, and this is my market, and I'm going to sell to them. That's not being true to me. That's not being true to my gift. So do I write you, for me. Do you not think that they could merge, John? 
Well, they merge because, again, completion. The Lord will merge it. Yes. But if I try and make a market, if I try and say, well, you got a right to your market. Well, if you're selling refrigerators, that might be true. If you're creating art, the artist is responsible to himself for the work. You want to please you. All right. And if, and if my books don't sell, and my career's been frustrating, my career's been disappointing, but guess what I have? I have integrity. Because integrity means you're sound. What does sound mean? Sound means you don't have any holes. Now, if I was just sitting here whining and crying, because my books haven't sold, and I thought I had, I, I'd lack integrity. All right? Now, another thing is we write with an authority. We should write with meekness. Ah, but not the meekness you're thinking about. Because you've got a religious attitude towards meekness. You've been told, oh, golly, Jesus, meek and mild, loves the flower and loves the child. All right? That type of meekness. Meekness is an old horse training term. It means strength under control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? Jesus is not the little lamb, and we're going to pet him and, and you know, play with the little Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's a lion. Yes. And like Aslan, you know, he's not safe, but he's good. But mostly meekness is strength under control. So... Now, when I write, I want to have that authority of strength and this atmosphere where I can breathe the air. See, women too often, again, women, don't throw rocks at me. I'm trying to bring you together, but I have to notice the differences. To women too often, a good a journey, saying, what's so great about Tolkien and the hobbits and all that? Hobbits don't want to go on a journey. They don't want to leave their nice little hobbit hole. But Gandalf comes along and says, we're going. Well, you know, all right. Too often in the in the nurturing con concept of women, a great journey is crossing the street to have tea with your neighbor. You know, boy, that's a great journey, and we're going to talk about our children. We're going to talk about our grandchildren, and you want the man to come. I mean, honestly, you know, he'll come because he's you know dutiful. You come to a man. All right, there's a knight sitting in you know, and he's he's been sitting around. You know, let's say he's he's all you know, <clears throat> Sir Hunkabod. And he's sitting there and he's got his sword and he's, he's bored to tears because they put dragons on the endangered species list. And he said, what am I ever going to, you know, and a knock comes on the door and he looks out and he goes, well, who's, oh, it's a damsel, you know, it's a damsel. And she must be in distress. And he opens the door and here's the damsel. And she says, oh, sir, Hunkabod, would you please come over and, 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 and come to my, my cottage. And he's like, yeah, I'll be right there. You know, he puts on his rusty sword because it hasn't been used for a while. And a breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, shines his feet with gospel of horseshoes. And off he goes. Okay. And he gets over to there and she leads him in. Well, her name is little damsel Dainty Doily. All right. And she takes him in. The whole room is like a china shop. I mean, there's, there's antiques here, and there's all kinds of stuff here, and there's china literally here, and everything's like that. And, and she says, oh, I'll make you tea. What do you want? Oh, you, I can tell you need chamomile. You need to relax there, night fella. You look a little stressed. I'll go get your chamomile tea. All right. And he's sitting there, and he's completely out of his atmosphere. He can't breathe. And he's thinking, if I move, my sword is going to knock something over, break all of her china. Mm -hmm. All right. And he starts backing out of that cottage. And she comes out and she goes, where did the night go? Where did the night go? Mm -hmm. All right. So <clears throat> we have to create that environment. Uh, I want to be read by women. And, uh, you know, Breaking of Ezra Ali is read by men and women. And there's a few women that will like it better than others. I want women to write books I can read. I mean, that's really one of the things I'm asking for. And, they, you know, I've got women, well, you can read mine. Well, how do you know? Do you really know the heart of a warrior? Do you really, the places I've been, the things I've seen and experienced, all right? I mean, this is, and not to mention my friends who are Vietnam veterans, and I have quite a few, Okay. And you're saying, I want to take you on this nice little pleasant walk. All right. Now, for those who are writing that for women, God bless them. All right. But I want to see literature reach a point where to kill a mockingbird is written in ways that glorify Christ. All right. Uncle Tom's Cabin, all of these great 
works of literature come in and it brings people together. Now, I know I might sound divisive right now, but I'm trying to rattle. You know, I'm trying to shake a little bit and say, don't try and balance me now. Just because you think I'm this cowboy extremist macho guy, I'm not. All right. Get to know me and you tell me about you and we'll move it together and we'll produce somebody better than us. That is so helpful. It wraps up everything so well. For a little while, we looked like we were excluding some people, but you're just showing us how we can all come together for God's glory, use the gifts he's given us. Not that it's easy, but that if we've lost the vision, we're never going to get there. You're, you're rein, not reinventing, but you're refiring the vision. And we thank you for that. I hope so. I hope, I hope so. so. I hope so. Let me check and see if we have anybody else. I'm not sure if we've, if we've, um, <clears throat> if we still have anybody. Hopefully we do. Your, your people are so loyal. We have, let's see. Better than us. Katie says That's day by true. day by day. I thought I turned this down. Excuse me. Here we go. Katie has many comments to say. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, so glad. Hey, Barb Haley, how are you? So good to see you. Barb agrees. We have two of two of the two people that I've looked at, the females. They <laughs> agree completely. Yes. Barb is still here. Kathy Jones and Katie Androsky, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, before we go, though, John, show us Pam. Is it Pam's? Jan. Will you spell out Jan's name, please? Jan Karen? Yes. I thought every... Everybody knew Jan Karen. You can't That's assume because that. I barely. All right. I mean, she sold millions, you know, and, and you know, everybody loves her Mitford series. Okay. And that's an O on the end. K-A-R-O-N. I mean, can I show you a couple of others? Yes. You know what a lot of people have, and the reason they're into anthropomorphism and why it's such a danger? They have nature deficit disorder. All right. And that's a true term. And you can read books like this one, Last Child in the Woods. And it talks about how if you let children play in nature without structure, just let them do what they do, hyperactivity drops hugely. Yep, I agree with that. So a lot of the problems we have right now and why people are trying to write so many of these romantic, cement, you know, sentimental kind of stuff is actually a yearning for nature that's kind of twisted and frustrated. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing of anthropomorphism and my fur baby, you know, we kill babies in the womb, but our little doggy is a fur baby. Yeah. All right. Uh, this one on killing. I don't want to read many Christian thrillers where, where they get into somebody being murdered or something unless they can do it like murder. She wrote and yeah. this marple and yeah. stuff, because most of you don't have a clue about death. And I don't, I, I, I get really strident about this, but people that are so crazy about their pets, have you ever put one down yourself? Mm, probably not. You, all right. You have a whole different reality. And this is a lieutenant colonel who writes about what killing is like. Do you know that in World War II, there was something like what? 1,000 shots fired for everyone that was actually aimed at the enemy. Because it's hardwired into the man not to shoot other men. And after World War II, they changed the targets from bullseyes to human shape. So yeah. when Vietnam came along, it was something like one in a hundred. You know? mm. But I mean, there's still people just shooting wildly because it's hardwired in them. So you can't have these detectives that go walking around just blasting people with no thought. It's not in us. That's why tribes all over the world, my, their name for themselves is the people. Oh, that sounds so nice. You know, we're the people. No, it's not nice because they say we are the people, but our neighbor isn't. So we can kill them indiscriminately because they're dogs. What did the Jews call the Sumerians? They were dogs. All right. Mm -hmm. What did we do in Vietnam? We talked about killing gooks. We yeah. dehumanize in order to kill. All right. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that concept. One person I really recommend everybody to read is, he's a, li he's a 
literary agent. His name is Donald Moss. M A S S. All right. And he's written a number of books. Uh But he will teach you more about writing and editing than almost anybody I know. And again, coming this way, he says the trend in 21st century fiction is the literary thriller. Because we got literary books that are so dense, they're narcissistic. They polish and polish and polish and polish until they look and all they can see is glare and they see their own reflection in the glare. Yeah. And I am a literary writer, but I, I see that downfall. You know, one word is out of place. What am I going to do? And they, they lose the story in it. And then too many thrillers are shallow. All right? They're just shallow. They can't write. So he points out that the, the trend is towards literary thrillers. Well, our walk with Christ should be thrilling, and we should be literary. It's, it's just made for us. Mm-hmm. All right, all right. We're closing this wonderful, wonderful session down, and we're so grateful that you were able to take the time to share all of this knowledge with us, John. I hope I didn't ruin your career. Uh, <laughs> you're not bothering me at all. I'm very, very proud to know you. Just based, just the littlest bit, and uh, I feel that uh, God has a relationship for us, a good friendship, sound friendship. Uh, and I'm praising for it in advance before it's ever come to complete fruition. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, viewers, if you're watching the replay or if you're live, feel free to comment, ask a question. um, And will you do me a favor, John, and would you type up those titles and the authors so that I can post that? Then we don't have those constant. If everybody can just go to one location and get all those. uh, Yeah, I can do kind of a syllabus, kind of a reading list. Yeah, that'd be great. So keep an eye out for that, and I will put it above the video um, as soon as I get it from John. <clears throat> this has been Marketers on a Mission, episode 129, How to Create Atmosphere and Write with Authority with distinguished author John Elmore. And I really learned a lot of information um, segueing from my uh, exit. I wanted to give you praise, John, because I've read books like you're describing but I did not know that's what they were doing. And um, that atmosphere and that authority where they set the tone and they set the stage. And I understand what's happening just because of the command of the language and the way that they're drawing word pictures. Um, I'm, it was good. It was really good. <laughs> it's really good. I'm good. I hope so. <laughs> oh, definitely. Definitely. And I know that you're going to have comments on that as well. Uh, tomorrow, viewers, Dee Lundgren will join me. She's going to share how to move beyond cat- catastrophic loss, and she will also share the six steps she's taking to build her platform that you can also do, right? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. We're here every weekday at 12 Pacific, 3 Eastern. This program is designed to help you learn the craft of writing from professional writers. Novel idea and how to market, then market your message online because your message, your audience is online. We must communicate with them clearly, go where they are and learn the online marketing techniques so that we can can meet each other and the Holy Spirit can orchestrate that meeting. We can be ready to serve them in his name. Mm. So good stuff. Appreciate you being here, staying with us. We will see you tomorrow.